everyone. Welcome to the Australian Herpticulture Podcast. How you going, Luke? Good, mate. Good. Got a bit of rain above you? Just a little bit, mate. That's just absolutely biking them down. Sounded like somebody was driving a tractor on your roof before. Yeah, I'm trying to landscape the backyard and I've got to keep redoing it every time it rains. <laughs> it just washes all the dirt <laughs> away. <laughs> well, at least you got your one big turtle pond of a backyard then. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. There you go. I can just keep all the species. It'd be great. <laughs> uh, so tonight, guys, we are joined by the one and only Steve Crawford, who is a python keeper from South Australia uh, that runs Prestige Pythons as well as a podcast host for the Aussie Wildlife Show. Steve, thank you for joining us and welcome to the show. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having me on. Um, congrats on the show. Thank it's you. gone. Uh, it's gone well so far. So I understand the the best in the NPR. So that's, that's pretty cool. You should uh, say that every podcast. Uh, yeah. We've actually just ticked over a year too. I think we forgot to mention that in the last few episodes as well. So, so. only one year yeah. above everyone. That's, that's yeah. all right. <laughs> yeah, not, not, not too bad. Obviously, the, the NPR original show is coming first, but I'm just glad that we're on top of the uh, Reptile Fight Club boys. <laughs> just in all <laughs> take it, Yeah, i got to take put a bit of steam nice up on <laughs> Yeah, no, I love listening to their show too. That's, yeah, that's one of my favourite on the network. It's so. a great, I love the yeah, concept. it's a great show. You get frustrated with with it and, and all sorts, which I think is great. You kind of get really involved. Yeah. Hopefully, um, I find yeah. myself running through things in my head when they're talking. I'm like trying to find points that I could argue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Justin has asked me to go on there, but it is that case. Like I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's arguing about things, and we try and steer clear of that in the reptile hobby. Well, some of us do. <laughs> yeah, some people. I was going to say, well, there's a lot of people that love that. Sort of stay away from the arguments. Uh, hopefully tonight comes out well and everyone can understand yeah. my Londonish um, accent. It's pretty nerve-wracking being on this side of the table. Um, oh, you'll yeah, be yeah, right, Hopefully we'll be all right. Don't say anything too silly. I'm down to. <laughs> no, <laughs> you, you'll be fine. And uh, you know, we've got, as a, as we said, we've got a few English listeners, and no, no doubt Nipper's probably having a cup of tea while he's watching this or listening to this as well. Yeah, so I just finished my cup of tea. I've been slurp through the show. Oh, good stuff, mate. Well, to kick us off, you know, we're going to run through some questions. Obviously, tonight you've had a bit of a look at them and that, but we want to kind of get a bit of a back history on yourself. So, you know, what yeah. actually got you started in the reptile keeping hobby in general? It was, um, unlike most people have that dinosaur-y kind of story that um, they go by, which I don't actually have. I've never really much been into to dinosaurs. Um, obviously, I find them really cool, and I'd have one as a pet tomorrow. Um, but, yeah, I, I, they're not available anymore, apparently. But <laughs> when I was a, a very young kid, I don't know, maybe I'd guess at six or seven years old, my dad um, basically used to be into some crazy things, I think, and... He took me and bought me um, uh, some garter snakes. Like I used to just keep some garter snakes with him and, and ribbon snakes um, at that stupidly young age. I probably wouldn't say to any kids nowadays uh, to keep garter snakes or, or any snake at six. It's probably, I don't know, you're probably borderline the age when you, when you might want to start keeping something. But um, found them just really intriguing. You know, he used to have parrots and things as well, African greys. It was just... The snakes, uh, I don't know what really made him go out and, and kind of say, let's get Steve a snake because he obviously wants one. Um, but we went to a pet shop, saw him there, um, picked a garter snake, and um, it, it kind of went like that for a while, um, you know, just with the odd garter snake here. And there, things like, you know, one of them got loose, and I can remember my, my pet dog bringing it back to me in its mouth which was called still alive so that was lucky oh. but um yeah it was kind of like that and and they never used to last long which now we know is because we used to feed them um goldfish we used to go to the local fairground and, and win goldfish on some game on there and and we'd feed them goldfish which we now know is really bad for reptiles goldfish so mm. um so yeah it was kind of a uh, something that I had. And then I went quite a few years without anything. Um, and, and one day my brother just, um, I met him with my brother somewhere and he said, oh, there's this cool aquarium shop, um, Swallow Aquatics in East Harlin, and they've got snakes up there. You should come and have a look. And went up there and looked. And um, I think 
brought, and I think I was probably late teens at this point, just brought my first Python, which um, sensibly, like, you know, keep it sensible when you're getting your first Python, was a, a Burmese Python. So, um, <laughs> you know, nothing wrong with that. That's a start a snake, garter snake, Burmese Python. Easy. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, which, which again, you wouldn't sort of say to someone nowadays, get, although Burmese Pythons are pretty good. And mine was, you know, when I got it, I think the first one was about six foot. So many years ago, I yeah. can't remember, you know, it's, um, it was about six foot. And then from there, it was kind of always there through the end of school, you know, but you, you never kind of had too many because uh, you didn't have the space and, and that. So, um, you know, I think I went Burmese python and then a couple of carpet pythons so many years ago. Um, and then, um, you know, things like boa constrictors. Being in England, you could have anything and everything really. So boa constrictors um, and, and just sort of a pair here and there and things like that. So, yeah, that's that's kind of what got me into it. Um, it it's just a fascination of, of snakes and boids, pythons and boas were the massive fascination for me. I just still now I'm as passionate now as I always was back then. And I, I had no idea back then what, I'm, what I was doing. And, and now I uh, have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was kind of like obviously your initial kind of passion that you, you got into it. Did it escalate pretty heavily over in the UK or was that when it came to Australia? No, it escalated um, way too badly in the UK. Um, <laughs> when um, I'll come back, uh, I'll go forward a little bit. When I when I left to come to Australia, um, I sold all of my animals, which, you know, to a certain extent, like some would say, oh, that must have been really upsetting and, and, and that. Yeah. But it kind of wasn't. I, I'd kind of done done my time, I thought, at that point. Um, so obviously yep. getting rid of bowlins, pythons and, and stuff like that was, was yeah. obviously hard. They were the last ones to go out. Um, that, you know, that was super hard because I know how special those snakes were and I really wanted to crack them. I want people to crack bowlins, pythons. Um, so we don't keep taking them out of the wild and things. Um, so I was ready for a break, um, with them at that point, but, um, yeah, it was just uh, so that that wasn't kind of too hard, but but early days, yeah, it took over um, massively. It was it was all under control up until the point when me and my now wife uh, Zita or Zeets um, got our own house, and and that was you know a, a big problem because um, <laughs> because she's she's amazing, my missus. She she puts up with a lot, yeah. but she doesn't really. Um, tried to stop me that often if I want to do that. Oh, that's good. That's yeah, good. She, really, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, if like you guys have got kids and got kids coming uh, or kid coming, maybe kids, they can support you. No, no. <laughs> this is one. We've checked. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be so easy, but we always decided early days yeah. that we weren't going to have kids. So it was, it was quite easy. We had um, our first flat, which we had, again, a couple of Burmese. And um, what did I have when we had that flat that I mean, that's so many years ago. Uh, Dumeril boas, um, Burmese. We had a lot of um, Euromastic lizards, um, which oh, are, yeah. are they're amazing things. But we both work during the day, and Euromastics are kind of, yeah, yeah you just don't see them at night. We yeah. get home from work, and, you know, England being dark by half one in the afternoon or whatever it was, you kind of get home, and they're, <laughs> they're gone. They're under their logs because we did give them nice, you know, logs and things to – and they'd be gone, so you kind of didn't mm. see them. So I didn't, you know, I regret it now because it's things like that that I love to keep again. But uh, my wife yeah. had beardies. She she kept and bred uh, too many beardies when she was into them. She's been super successful with lizards. Um, so in that flat, cool. we had things like that. And uh, I think we had chameleons back then as well. Um, uh, it was just, it was a good time because it couldn't get too big. But, you know, there was a, a spare bedroom there that... that there was a, a few things in there. Um, mainly, I was really into my big stuff then, so mainly like, you know, your berms, you know, a retic here and there. Um, I think at that point I had an anaconda at some point there uh, and stuff, you know, where you, you kind of, geez, it was 
you know, to, to Australians and people, they kind of think, well, oh, that's amazing, that's weird. But it was just so easy over there. You'd take it for granted. Yeah. You didn't keep anything. You don't, it didn't really have the space to keep all of it. Um, but, yeah, I love Burmese pythons. Um, Matt Somerville, I love Burmese pythons. I think they're his <laughs> least favourite python. Um, <laughs> so, so they are they are cool. But, yeah, so the flat wasn't so much. Um, but yeah. then we, we moved to our house and we got our first mortgage and everything um, and we had a nice yeah. big garage to, to, to do and um, fit all that out and, and it, that, that's when it went a bit crazy. I mean, we've been known to um, remortgage to buy snakes. Okay. We, <laughs> that's pretty uh, next level. Yeah, we, we've remortgaged. I remortgaged yeah. to buy, like, uh, I think it was about uh, it was uh, it was tens of thousands or yes of pounds. So you know for blackheads, um, for the, the bowlings, for things you know, um, it, it it got well out of hand. <laughs> 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 They're investments. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, well, you're going to get a good return, right? Yeah, yeah that's Bowling's right. It would have been a great <laughs> investment if I could actually breed them. Yeah. Um, to, yeah. I mean, nowadays I should have kept them and, and kept them till now and then sold them because they are so much money now. So, yeah. What were they worth when, if you don't mind me asking, when you did get them, like roughly? Well, when I, when I first got mine, I got my first pair, um, I think it was in late 2003 or early 2004, my first hatchling pair, which wow. came from Indo. Um, great friend of mine, Simon Fiodori, brought them in, um, brought a few in, and and I think they were around £1,200 each, something like that. I think because I was friends with Simon, they might have been a little bit less, but around £1,200 each, so $2,500 roughly, two two and a half thousand dollars roughly each. That's not too bad. Up to kind of £1,800 each, um, you know, depending on where you yeah. got them from. And who was bringing them in? Um, and now, I mean, like, they're rumored to be ten grand or something. Yeah, yeah I've heard that. And I think that's US as well. If I'm yeah. Not mistaken. Yeah. So, so yeah, probably a bit less UK then. But yeah, a lot of money. Um, but I, I bought. Yeah. Um, I think this was a mortgage purchase. I bought a pair of adults or a trio of adults. It was actually buying the pair of adults, and then there was a massive female that came with it, which had a huge kink in her back. She was fine. She did everything okay, yeah. but she broke her back at some point. Um, I say broke her back. Mm. She had full movement everywhere. It was just, a, you know, it was a kink. Beautiful girl. Really yeah. nice. Uh, big 10, 11 foot adult snakes. Um, and I think they they cost me, I think they were about five grand for the pair, pounds. And it was an extra grand or something for that extra female that I just wanted because, because of her kink. Like <laughs> So, yeah, that's... <laughs> It's it's big money really for snakes when we're talking. That was maybe I, I'm looking at pictures the other day. I think that was around 2005, 2006, something like that. Yeah, so, geez. yeah. It's, it's pretty weird the money that I, I I do have to ask, like just as a kind of like offshoot question, because obviously in Australia most of our big snakes are pretty slender built compared to some of the stuff that you've worked with in the past. What's it like working with animals that are so heavy bodied? Um, well, the bowlings, if you look at all my pictures of my bowlings, they do look heavy bodied um, and they shouldn't be. Um, they, they should be longer and slender than as most pythons. Um, they weren't terrible. There was just like a, a couple of the adults that I had brought in as adults were, were big snakes. But yeah. when you talk like I used to keep blood pythons, um, I mean, I've had the three species of blood pythons and they're immense. You know, I used to have an eight foot female um bronger's my the, the red blood python and i i actually very sad story with her i actually killed her by lifting her out of her cage she was in a I think it was about five or six foot by two foot cage and you know where you've got the the lip at the bottom where your door runners are on like you've just got six inches or something as a bottom thing just for you to keep substrate mm, in. Yeah. and just me pulling her out like bit by bit um onto there I didn't know, obviously, at the time. Uh, next day I went in and, and she was dead and I'd actually ruptured um, blood vessels and that inside her body by 
resting it on that thin 16 mil bit of melamine board. Um, wow. So, again, they were, even for blood pythons, they were massively overweight, um, probably. But, um, yeah, look, it's really weird. Like like a Burmese python, that, that's a, an enormous snake, even if you keep it slender. That's that's a big snake. Mm, yeah. the, the, the good thing with Burmese pythons, um, you know, when you look at a Burmese python that's, say, 14, 15 foot long, um, if it's going to strike at you, it will strike and throw itself at you and you kind of go around vacuum, have a little dust around, cup of tea, maybe do a few other chores. And then even by then it hasn't actually hit you. Like it's so mm. bloody slow. Uh, you know, you, you can easily <laughs> kind of yeah. get out of their way most of the time. The, the little ones are quicker. But but berms are really good for that. They're, they're, they're actually, I think, quite hard to get bitten by when you understand their their body and, and what they're going to do. So um, yeah. they're not as scary as um, King Horny, as a scrubby, Australian scrub python. It's yeah. way yeah. more scary to me than a Burmese python um, and, and way harder to, to handle. They want to go up, um, you know, you, and, and when they get to those big sizes, if you grip them, and I made this mistake, if you grip them, they'll come around and, and have a pop at you if they don't, you know, if they don't want to be handled in that. So yeah. um, I, I think um, apart from if a Burmese gets hold of it, a, a big adult Burmese gets hold of you in rapture, um, I think our scrubbies are way harder and, and probably more dangerous than a Burmese. A retic, again, in captivity, pretty slow because they're pretty fat. Um, but again, they're not the quickest of strikers. They're not the, you know, yeah. but if they get hold of you, oh, boy, you're in, you're in big trouble. Um, so, yeah, I'd say scrubbies are, are, are somewhat dangerous. They're, they're quick and got them. I, I think, like, weird thing to say about snakes, but they, they're, they're a lot um, smarter, I think, than a Burmese python. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Blood pythons, like uh, one of the scariest things ever for my my wife when we used to have, uh, we had the the, the, uh, the black blood pythons, the Curtis, and uh, we used to every week or, or yeah probably every week maybe week ten days we used to have a big uh, water container in the room and we would put the blood pythons in there and put lids on just to soak them for a while, um, just to give them a proper soak in water, um, and the black blood pythons hated it. And they were big, you know, they were they were big, hefty snakes, and they would explode with so much power that they would jump up in the air about three or four foot. Mm-hmm. And it used to scare the bejeebas out of you. It was really like, you know, they're not big snakes, they're only maybe five foot long snakes, but, but they're, thick. they're thick as. And when they explode in those situations, like it's just, you can't help but jump out of your skin. Um, and give a little bit of a squeal. Weird. <laughs> like a little ball <laughs> yeah, of muscle. Yeah. Quite strange. So, yeah, some of these snakes are very, very different to Australian pythons, for sure. Well, th- that's why I ask, because, you know, obviously we don't get the experience of that yeah. sort of stuff here, and, and you've been open to that sort of gear. And, you know, whilst we watch videos on other people that might keep them or hear other podcasts or whatever, it's it's kind of cool to hear it face-to-face about some of these animals. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, just different stuff. A lot of them are kind of very similar. You know, your New Guinea sort of stuff is is very similar, um, yep. really. But then, yeah, when you get onto the to the islands, the, the you know, Borneos and Sumatras and up into Myanmar and places like that, you get the bigger, you seem to get the bigger-bodied um, snakes and things that are, yep. yeah, just that bit different than than stuff that we get down here, the the actual pythons, I guess. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So it was good. I do miss, um, I, I do miss, you know, things like a Burmese python. I, I do truly love Burmese pythons. And, you know, in, in the UK, and that, there was a time where you'd get it as a hatchling because they're the most stunning hatchlings ever. Um, and you, you'd get it as a hatchling and they'd be worth a bit of money, you know, and then you'd get it to six eight foot you know three meter mark and then they'd be worth nothing like you can get you can get them out of all the rescue centers because that's just where people don't want them they want this pretty little thing yeah that a pet shops kind of probably said that will stay the same size as a royal python or something ridiculous 
And then yeah. they start getting like good money when they're, you know, three, four, five, six meter kind of animals, you know, big, hefty. And then you, you kind of, there, there could be a lot of money in big Burmese. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing. It's a shame because really should things like Burmese pythons be used in, in a pet trade? Jeez, I don't know. Be a good argument to say not, wouldn't there? Like, you know, and I'm talking about in countries where there's no licensing, you know, we're yeah. licensed here, so I can't keep a scrub python unless I prove that, you know, I'm... You know, like, I too kind of think. Same with your venomous snakes. Yeah, uh, yeah venomous. I mean, I've, yeah. geez, I'd be dead now if I had venomous. So it's something I've <laughs> had very little of, only really rear, rear fang stuff, if anything. Um, yeah. Because yeah. I'm very complacent with things like that. Yeah, yeah, I think I, that's the problem with them. I'd be dead too. Yeah, well, even like with scrubby, I mean, recent years, um, I've got my scrubbies downstairs, like my my adult southern scrubbies. I'm going to call them southern scrubbies, King Horny. Northern scrubbies, I, I'll, I'll say they are northern scrubbies. They're smaller to me, uh, and they'll, I think they're going to be reclassified as possibly, hopefully, Amethystina. Um, so we might yeah. have two species of scrubby which would be cool they look a little bit uh, different they look a lot different i don't think they get as big and things like that but my yeah. big gal downstairs my big southern scrubby um king orny she she's horrible she's just like every chance she gets she she will every chance she gets she'll take me and she's bitten me a few times um it's just ridiculous where you know i, I just kind of think right i've got to get in there and do something but it's all right. I'm mm. fully aware, and bang, she's got me. You, you know, <laughs> oh shit. And the last time she got me, she got me on the chest, like got my skin on my chest, and and she oh. tried to wrap it as well. So she had that in her mouth, like pulling skin out, and I, you could almost hear it ripping off of my rib cage while she was actually trying to constrict oh, wow. that bit of skin. It was insane. Um, but her dad, who's oh, even bigger, and and. Headwise, geez, her dad. Um, he's owned by one of my best mates in the world ever, uh, Matt Bonnet down here, Matthew Bonnet, legend in the reptiles. Um, we, um, he was ill a few years ago, and, and I was helping him clean out his big scrubbies, like the parents to mine, and um, and his the, the dad, like his mouth is he's got to be fifteen foot long, is huge, you know, got to be five meters, wow. big head, like enormous head. And, and we got it out of the cage, put it in a box, and I kind of felt, oh, I didn't feel confident. I didn't feel that went too well. Um, and then um, we were we were putting it back in its cage, cleaned its cage out, putting it back in its cage. It didn't really want to go, so it was going up. And, and what I said earlier, you know, you kind of then having to grab it to pull it back and reel it in, and it came round. And it, it didn't want to, like, eat me or anything like that, obviously. It just gave me a piss-off bite, you know. It was just... Yeah, straight on the hand, let go, slash pull away a bit, um, and then went back in its cage. It was just, but you know, even no matter how good you get, you, you can never take these things for granted. Um, so Parks and Wildlife will Especially come and take my scrub pythons too. off me now. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so just just out of curiosity, because I mean, I've never really had big snakes. Mm. You know, I've had carpets and you know an olive that got to the size of a carpet mm. before i had to move it on what is it that interests you so much about like scrubbies in particular that might might be that little bit more fiery is it is it the challenge of keeping them that it, is that what you kind of get it into? is yeah it is a little bit it's, i think it's um and again i've just negated what i'm going to say like what i said previously I, that is negating what i'm saying now but you I, I believe you have to get to a level of you know um actually understanding how a python's going to act, what it's going to do, when it's going to do it, <clears throat> you know. Um, and, and scrubbies are kind of, I don't know, they're almost like they're, they're dumb, as, dumb as shit in a lot of ways, but they almost seem like if you're in my reptile room and you're doing cleaning, you can you can feel something looking at you and you will always yeah. just be able to look at the scrub python cages straight away and they'll be following you around the room i don't know how else to explain it they are following you around the mm. room and and that you know you 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 keep you know some of the dumbest pythons in the world blackheads and things like that that 
you know, would never do stuff like that. Sorry, Blackheads. Hmm. Um, <laughs> um, you know, Scrubbies seem to have that, I don't know, that, that little bit of savvy about them. Um, yeah. And it's just a it's, a, it's a, a next level of learning about snakes. Um, you know, people who keep venomous, you know, not just because they're so deadly, but, you know, you've got taipans that are the same kind of situation. They're, they're Apparently, I've never kept them, but apparently they're, like, really switched on, really quite smart yeah. in, in things in certain situations. Um, and that's, you know, why, I mean, there's obviously people out there who go, I'll keep a taipan because I'll keep a taipan, you know. Um, yeah, but yeah. The, but they are. that's probably the time for big snakes as yeah, well. Yeah, but there is, to, yeah. to serious hobbyists, there is that yeah. next level to keeping a taipan or to keeping a scrub python, um, you know, that, that it makes you learn about stuff. And, and it's same in England, you know, when, you know, you keep things like the white lip pythons, um, Papuan pythons, all stuff like that. All of these, if you're really into your animals and really study them, they all give you a different perspective of, of how these pythons do act. You know, it's, it's, it's so weird how you can read so much with pythons you can learn so much with different species and i don't really think about it until you know we're sat here having that chat and then you start thinking you know i, I think um if i had to think about that question longer than i just had the time to think about it you, I, it would have been hard to you probably come but we just you know yeah. we just cracked it out there it's just the fact that so many pythons act differently um yeah, and and scrubbies are just, I think, next level on understanding pythons. Yeah, I hundred percent get what you mean there. I hundred percent because having owned a blackhead, having owned wormwood and stuff like that. <laughs> yep, <laughs> I can see the difference. Food. Yeah, <laughs> that's strange. Well, well, you know, like my my olive, like some people give olives a bad rap, but the one that I had was was really good too. And he kind of followed you around and would suss you out yeah. all the time and stuff like that. And, you know, he was very interactive and I, I hadn't had that with a lot of pythons in the past. So yeah. it was kind of cool to, yeah. to know, like, oh, I have to be a little bit more careful with this one because he knows what's going yeah, on. I agree. And, and my olives is, is something that will come out and look at you as well. Um, not the albino ones and eyes are shit. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, my, my olives will do a, a similar thing as well. Um, but yeah, you know, and scrubbies, it's it's great. They they sit up there and they perch like um, chondros the whole time. They'll perch up. Mm. Um, I give them a bit of uh, above heat as well, and he's got, or she's got a big perch. They all have, and and they'll come up and perch really regularly. Like it's like greens. They, they really are pretty cool like that. You know, that's it's nothing better than you see a little green tree python up on a perch, but you get a you know a big three four meter. Of giant Plus scrubby. Scrubby actually perching exactly like a green tree with its head rested in the middle. Um, you, you're kind yeah. of waiting for the tail to come over and start cool luring. That's one you won't put your hand in. Though. No, that's right. Yeah, that's that's when you get it out. <laughs> and there is someone yeah. here in South Australia that's died from a, a scrub python, so they are, you know, they are a bit oh, wary wow. of... Um, people keeping them a bit because they are a deadly snake you you can never switch up yeah, that, definitely. they are a deadly snake um you know you, you have locks on doors and things for them um so yeah it's pretty oh, yeah stuff. pretty cool so so now that we're kind of talking about your you know your australian reptiles that you've you've got there when you actually did move over to move over to australia how did your reptile keeping actually change during that transition, I was right. I brought, I illegally brought all my animals over from England. <laughs> no. um, well, when I when I actually moved here, the plan was I weren't going to keep anything. It was just like yeah. oh, I'm not, you know, not that fuss. Um, and then you kind of, I think it was, I, mean, I think it was about two months, but it was probably about two weeks that I think my wife just went. <laughs> just where well, you just go and buy a snake because i was on all the forums chatting to people on the phone chatting to people yep. and stuff like that she was just like just you're gonna just, just have to buy it. snakes like you know what was the first snake you got when you got over here jesus um i think it was roughy oh, nice. i think it was roughies that was the first snake yep. that i got closely followed by pygmies and stimmies 
um, and then blackheads. Blackheads are actually one of my favourite Australian pythons. Um, that yeah. I do. I've got a fondness for blackheads, especially exanthic ones, which I don't own at the moment. Again, but I'll have to yeah, get them again. Stunning, yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah. It was. I think that was pretty much how they came in. And then I really got to know Matt Bonnet really well, who I knew from England. Yeah. Um, uh, so got to know him very well, and we shared a load of different projects and things. And I, I took some of his animals on and played around with those. So it was, yeah, it was, it was good. What, what are your thoughts on ruffies? Because, like, obviously they're one of Jason and my favourite pythons and you know pe- people always kind of laugh because you know in australia they're supposedly a bit of a throwaway snake because they're yeah a dime a dozen but i mean i love them to bits but what are your so thoughts are so undervalued they they are um I agree. they are way up there as as i mean it's really weird because i say our oh, blackheads is one of my favorites so is ruffies um you know yeah. I, I find them amazing i find the the story of them the history of them um, and, and things mm. is, is, you know, just, it, they're just absolutely insanely beautiful snakes that change colour so much. Um, you know, got the biggest teeth ever. You know, I used to have uh, emerald tree boas in, in England um, and they have got, out of all the boys, they've got the biggest pound for pound teeth. But I tell you what, rough scales come pretty close to that. Yeah, right. They are very impressive. The, the, the colour, the texture, everything about them, I just find them amazing. Um, and it, it's one of those snakes, and I know we'll get onto enclosures and that at some point, like and how I keep them, whatever. But there's certain snakes that you can't help but to give, you know, a, a bit of a colour background, a few more logs, a nicer yeah. hide. <laughs> you, know, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. you know, as we'll find out about the way that I keep stuff. Um, but then you've got anomalies with me, like, you know, my roughies have quite a nice enclosure compared to the others with just white backgrounds and you know the arm pellies obviously um they'll be a throwaway snake in a few years um stuff like that (laughs) we still can't keep them here though unfortunately (laughs) yeah no they won't they're they're pretty amazing as well but i absolutely love ruffies um i've got so many favorite pythons in the world it's ridiculous because people always say oh what do you think about ruffies and i'll go yeah it's one of my favorites what do you think about this oh that is my favorite and what you guys it's kind yeah. of my passion for for pythons and a lot of boas as well but i can't tell people what boas i've got over here so <laughs> you, uh, keep that quiet <laughs> um i am definitely going to get raided after this i've got a feeling <laughs> um, Be- better have your books in order yeah, i do not have any bows. <laughs> um, but you know same with bow in 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 england pythons and bowers like you you know keep them all and at one point i kept yeah. a lot of both but you you kind of have to specialize if you're gonna specialize you kind of have to go down one road with them um which i did towards the end was just pythons um but bow you yeah. can't you can't beat the shape of a of a common boa, like that kind of square set shape yeah. of, a, of just a you know a common boa or a red tail boa or um, something. I just think they're amazing. And my favourite was Hog Island boa out of the uh, boa constrictors. So that's a I think story. that's what I like about the ruffies too. That that head shape that the ruffies have. The ah uh, the, the the diamond head of the the ruffies. And that, yeah. yeah, I mean, my my wife. Um, We've got a lot of Anteresia here as well. She's not ever as keen on the Anteresia. Um, yep. She loves the shape of Morelia, the head shape of Morelia. Yeah. She, she just yep. like, not that she handles them or anything like that, but but shape of head, I, I couldn't agree more. Like Morelia are specky. I think that's why I never really got an into Anteresia. It's just for the head shape, really. Yeah. Yeah, I like some of some of the morphs and stuff tickled my fancy, mm. but um, yeah, I just never really got into them. Just I just well, they're just something about they're, them. They're just, kind yeah. of there as a um, you know, people that are, are, are very um, you know, don't like pain and are very scared of snakes like Pete Birch. That's what enters you. <laughs> 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 oh, putting the wind up, yeah, already. That's it already. <laughs> 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 nah, he um. He's got such a like. He's got a collection of everything. That guy, um, it's yeah. amazing what he's got. So, no. yes, it's um, it's one of those things. I think 
You still there, Jason? You just dropped out a bit. No. Oh, we're still ready. Yeah, I'm dropping That's in and out. The storm's coming back, I think. So, yeah, still That's going. Right. Yeah. Still going. Um, so, w- what does your reptile collection look like a little bit like these days? Like, obviously, you've touched on a few things there, but sure, you've got some other stuff that's kind of hidden in the back. Um, yeah, like I've got, um, I think I've got every every species of python at the moment, um, like mm-hmm. Australian species of python, yeah. which is, you know, which is easy if you're dumb enough to spend big money on things like Owen Pellies, um, <laughs> which... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not made of money, but um, I'm, a, I'm an absolute massive python lover. So, you know, of all the years of, of going, oh, you know, I, you, you can keep every python in the world and blah, 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 we kind of all ignored Owen Pelly because we couldn't mm. keep it. So what Gavin yeah. had done there, unbelievable, um, forever thankful for that because uh, he bought an amazing python in the captain. Yeah, amazing. Um so that's cool. But over here, yeah, all the pythons, um, and then with the pythons, you know, there's a there's a few morphs there. I've got a few kind of cross carpet morphs at the moment because um, I like exanthic, so I've got some exanthic type stuff, but they're not pure anythings. Um, so I've got some of that, but mainly I try and stick to pure and pure morphs as well. So you know, in my children, uh, children's pythons, my favourite morph ever is is the marbles i think they're just beautifully insane i've got far too many marbles um it's ridiculous so so all the entries yeah that's all good but um on top of the pythons i mean i i do keep some lizards um calm down boys it's all right no. Or you can see me perk up then. <laughs> you know what then? Um, I, yep. I do uh, i do see peace and lizards but <laughs> my uh, my frillies are the only ones that are inside um and i'm yep. actually hoping to get them outside as well which in south australia can be a bit tricky because we have extreme heat quite cold um and it's very dry so i'm going to try and divide the waste right and leave them out as long as i can during the year and then i'll come in during winter apart from that the only other lizards i keep is stuff that i can only like that i can keep outside so i am um what have i got outside i've got my lacy um dino who i get some pictures up he's cool he's a good guy um my wife hand reared him um or, or hand you know, tamed him if you want um we spent a lot of time with him inside when we had him inside when he was smaller built a big enclosure outside put him out there which he turned feral which really upset the wife but she got him calm again he's he's pretty laid back um he's he's a cool cool geezer as i would say um and then i've got um i've got blue tongues outside so during the summer i have my centralian blue tongues outside um they're in now for winter um i have my um what are they bloody called um blotches they're outside all year round um, but they've moved been moved to a corner plot at the moment and um Western, uh, a Western blue tongue from Perth, from oh, nice. Matty Harris over there, who used to breed the best, but he's, he's not got them anymore. Um, they, they're they great. They're great, the Westerns, actually. I need to get some females for that. If anyone knows of any, um, <laughs> his name's Spot. My, if anything's named, it's, it's my wife's animal. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then we've got a group of shinglebacks. Now, shinglebacks are... Uh, I mean, way superior to pythons in my eyes. They're just awesome. I can't get enough of shinglebacks. Yeah. Um, I've always loved shinglebacks. Uh, I, I love it. Even if we're out, you know, looking around outside, herping or something somewhere, like, and I see a shingleback, that's it, you've lost me. I'm just <laughs> watching that and following it around. Seeing it. <laughs> I find those things amazing. And we've just, uh, about a week ago, we had two babies off one of our females. Um, which was um, I mean, geez, a highlight awesome. of my life, highlight of my reptile life. Uh, it's the first time we got babies from them. And then yeah. today, awesome. uh, it's great because it took my mind off um, doing a podcast with you guys. Um, <laughs> we got another three babies <laughs> off of one female. Wow. Um, yeah. It's a big litter. Yeah, big litter of three. That's uh, unreal. They are yeah. 60% the size of the two out of the other litter. So the two were 101 and 107 grams. These are around 60 to 70 grams. 
So yeah. they're like loads smaller because there's obviously three. Wow. And there's one more huge female out there that hopefully is going to give us babies. Our summer's been terrible. So, like, you know, we're talking May and we're talking about I'm only just getting shingle back babies. You know, it should be April at yeah. worst. Um, but our summer's mm. been terrible. So they held on and, and I've got lights and that out there, heat lamps and shit to try and bring them along. But that is, yeah. I mean, you know, what a highlight of my the whole life of reptiles like those, those things are just yeah wow it almost like almost brings you to tears when you see something like that and you think nothing you know yeah. you, you've done a lot in the reptile world and then you do something like that and it's just insane like yeah but it would also be good to have something that's a little bit different to your pythons for that sort of reason too just to kind of have that bit of diversity that yeah. kind of spices it up a bit for you yeah yeah it's always been like i said it's always been my passion all through like in england and that i'd always had the odd you know different thing here and there mainly because my wife was in to in uh to, to lizards as well um so she had chameleons and we, we bred i mean one year she bred she had i think it was about a hundred chameleons one year oh. and we went like I, I said, because I was going to the the um, cricket wow. place like every week to get thousands of crickets. And I just went, I can't cope with this. You, you're not breeding them anymore, and we kind of like got rid of them and got rid of the adults as well because it was just too time consuming. Those things, sadly, literally breed themselves to death. Um, you know, one clutch I think yeah. was sixty eggs out of you know, it was it was insane. Um, just wow. found my pictures yesterday for all those. It was pretty cool. What's so the lifespan of the chameleons? Well, the adult females, like, you know, they, they get a breeding season and, and pretty much die out. You know, they can live a few years, three or four years, but they, right. they'll literally just try yeah. to keep breeding and keep breeding. It's, you know, you, even if you split them up, which obviously we split them up, we, we tried not to breed them, um, but then they'd still chuck you out eggs. Um, it's just horrible. It's just not actually nice. So for all those reasons, as I said, yeah, we've got to get rid of them. Yeah. I don't want that happening again next year. Um, so, but it was cool. But equally, like, you know, again, that's one of those pinnacle points that you kind of go, this is amazing. Like, you know, we've got, got found a picture earlier where you just look at the viv that they're in and it's almost like a competition thing, mm. how many chameleons you can see. See, it was hilarious. <laughs> But um, funny story with the chame- chameleons that no one else is going to like apart from me. Um, we had them in like a, a quite a high arboreal viv with two sets of doors at the top, two sets of doors at the bottom. It's a uh, Herptech Nico in France, who's a good friend, makes a viv called Herptech vivs. Um, amazing vivs, and he did a two high arboreal one. And when all the chameleons were in there, if you went to them through the top door and kind of um, if you freaked them out in any way, which obviously you wouldn't try to, unless they all dive bomb to the floor. Like they roll up in little balls and dive bomb to the floor. So, you know, <laughs> you know obviously people come around and you oh, want to yeah. show them that, don't you? That's a little, <laughs> little bit of fun. But, yeah, they used to just roll up into a ball and dive onto the ground. It was you had to have leaflet on the ground so they didn't hurt themselves. Quite, yeah, quite funny. Yeah, sorry about that, everyone who's listening, but it happened. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty amazing, though. Like, obviously, it's a good exit strategy for them, like, rather than just, you know, holding their camouflage. Yeah, it's really weird. Like, they'd literally go into a ball, and you'd look at them on the the floor, and you'd you'd give it, uh, I mean, it seemed like a few minutes, but it was probably 30 seconds or a minute, and then they all of a sudden, like, come back up and then start walking back up the top. (laughs) (laughs) That's unreal. (laughs) Oh, dear. Yeah. So w- with your reptile collection these days, what sort of practice preferences do you have when it comes to running the collection? <laughs> um, in respects of how I keep them and that? Yeah, yeah. Like how have you got your, your setup kind of set I've up? Got, um, I've actually just built a brand new shed, um, finished it a few oh, months awesome. ago. So uh, I will go up on my YouTube channel. I do have a YouTube channel, which has only got one kind of commercially thing on it at the moment. Um, that I want to start doing that and, and the build of it will go up, the build of the shed, because uh, I've kind of focused awesome. all, the, all the points. Yeah, new shed. It's only six metres by five metres, so not huge. Um, it's kind of a first step to other other things. Um, mm. But within that, I, I do like racking systems. I do have racks. Um, I think if used correctly, uh, 
they're cool, they're good. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have um, a few racks because I, along with Matt Bonnet, used to import the, the Vision racks from America. Um, ah, okay, for, yeah. For many years, that we we bought those in Snake Racks Australia, which is no longer because a it's way too expensive to import stuff, um, and, and b you know we did I think we did nine or ten shipments, which is a lot of racks in a in a small. Um, small keeping kind of sized country like Australia. Yeah. So it was kind of taking too long to sell a shipment and just not viable anymore. So um, sadly we packed it in, but equally like you do, um, you do see people now using these racks that we imported that do kind of um, abuse what they're there for a bit, but we'll, we'll get onto that probably later. Um, but so I've got the racks and I try and keep stuff, yep. you know, as well as I can in racks. And then I've got a lot of caging as well, like um, got three foot, four foot, five foot and six foot cages for different animals. And then my, my big female scrubby who's, who's about three and a half meters. She's got, what's hers, her cages? I think it's three meters by 60 deep or something like that. And then um, just over a meter, I think it's four foot high. Um, with climbing and that so kind of try and um, fit everything in there I I try and keep stuff in in cages that are not massively too small for them or too small for for the for the snakes Um, but equally um, you know without giving everything huge great big enclosures which they probably some of them probably deserve bigger enclosures but they're certainly not um uncomfortable in their enclosures so i have a, a big mixture and yeah. um, the plan is to get some outside as well during summer i've got a, an area that's kind of a bit shaded that i think i'll get away with it with certain species um that'd be cool yeah it'll be nice i think there's certain species that can live outside for quite a bit of the, the summer as long as i can shade them well enough and give them a, maybe even a cool box more than anything but um things to work on um but yeah in the shed it's it's cages it's um stuff like that uh I heat everything like the racks are heated, obviously, because they're already molded shells that are heated with heat cable. Um, yep. All cages, I only heat. My heating with pythons is heat mats. I only use heat mats, habistat heat mats, yep. and climate heat mats, mainly habistat. Um, and absolutely everything is on a thermostat. And everything should always be on a thermostat. I'm, you know, then these things can go wrong. And, and thermostats can be one of those things that, that keep you safe and keep the animals safe. Um, so yeah, all of that. Uh, and, and I think um, on my on my course, I show how where I put heat mats on the floor of these cages. I have them inside the cages because what I use at the moment is melamine vibs. One day I will change yep. over to the molded plastic vibs probably, um, but I can't afford to do that at the moment because I bought Owen Pellies. Um, so I, I put them and then I seal the heat mat in with, um, a core flute, so plastic core flute and, and actually glue that and stick it in there and seal it up so that they can't, you know, tip over a water bowl onto it, uh, wheel over it or anything like that. It's fully sealed under there. Um, and, and kind of not silicon in, but there's a, there's a similar type of glue seal that I use. Uh, to seal those in so that the heat mats are perfectly safe, you know, from from water and that. Because you get it doesn't take a lot of water on any of those heat mats to actually cause um, a, a bit of trouble for you. So, does does water tend to kind of because like I, I mean I've used a lot of heat mats but I've never had any issues with mm. it and I, I haven't exactly done research into issues with heat mats. Um, but does water create like hot spots or is it about getting into like the cables? It gets into the cables. I'll tell you what happens because I, I actually, <laughs> of everything I just said, when I built, I built a couple of, uh, they're about five foot by two foot by three foot high cages, which was for a female Owen Pelly, uh, which she's growing out of now, so she'll need something bigger. And for my female Rough Scout, which are, are nice cages, you know, did a, uh, did a load of things for some unknown reason. I put the core flute down, but I didn't seal it in. Um, so you know, this kind of cements what I'm what I'm saying. I was in there and I was um, I was spot cleaning. So I was taking the rough scale python. I was taking a crap out of there 
and and it was a bit wet so i was trying to get that together and put it out the cage and it kept feeling like something was stabbing me really hard in the fingers i was like geez what is that like what if she dropped some teeth and i'm crunching down on some teeth or something like what is that and it wasn't it was electric it was electric going like where she'd actually weed under her hide um, and, yeah. and it had got onto it. It had gone underneath the core flute. And when I lifted it all up, the, the heat mat underneath was actually wet with pee. Um, I, I have no idea why I forgot to seal it in. It was, it was really quite strange, but I did. And there you go, straight away, you know, that was the problem. A, a fire, but B, she must have been feeling that as well. She was actually, she'd spent a few days up on a branch above her height, so she hadn't gone onto the heat mat. And I wonder, or I'm pretty sure, that that would have been because she was getting little little shocks from that heat mat. Um, yeah. So, yeah, heat mats, the, the little electric square bit on the end, you know, you really have to protect them because if they get a bit of water in there, you're screwed. And it's as simple as that. You know, I've, I've got, I don't know, probably 30 or so vivs or more downstairs that I've, sealed heat mats in all of them apart from those two and i nearly ended up with a a dead snake a, a special snake you know they're all special but a rough scale is way more special than most of the others <laughs> mm. but you know i almost end up ended up damaging her um i don't I still yeah. don't know if i did damage her in any way i mean she does go into her hide now she seems completely normal she's fed she's sloughed she's done everything uh so it's, you know mm. um so that's how I do the heat in. Uh, lighting, I use um, something from Bunnings called um, a, a Pup Lights. You buy it in Bunnings, mm-hmm. they're 12 volt you, um, uh, LED lights that you, you just little round units that you stick in each cage, screw in, and it connects to an adapter and everything. And and that's what lights them up because they don't they put out very little heat. Um, Mm-hmm. So I have them as just to light up a cage. Obviously, that's for me, not for the snakes. They don't see those lights. They don't really know that it's light. You know, there's a light on or not. Um, and I always, absolutely always, on. And it's surprising how many people don't, but always have a good hide in the cage, water bowl as well. But yep. always have a good hide that they can go in and um, you know fairly tight for them, so they can go in and feel secure. In those hides, I think it's so important for anything, but but for pythons, for definite. Um, you know, you've got things like green trees that will never use a hide, um, and yeah. the scrubby very rarely. She goes in her hide when she's sloughing. Other than that, she's out on her perch the whole time. Um, yeah. Funnily enough, just talking about hides, my male green tree from time to time. I mean, obviously, my green trees and stuff. Most of my stuff's in natural sort of mm. setups. Um, but my male green tree doesn't mind getting on the ground and going underneath all the leaf litter. Yeah. Yeah, and it'll just sit down there. Once upon a time, people used to go, oh, there's something wrong with it. It goes to the floor. But, yeah. well, you know, why not? Like, why wouldn't they? So, yeah, he's, he's getting down there and he's getting in the leaf litter and getting a, all the humidity that he loves at that point. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wild, yeah, but I just find it. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. I've never, I've never yeah, had a green that's, that goes on the floor or anything. I've never had that. But I'm just a better keeper, probably. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, there's, there's nothing it, wrong with your grains. The first time he did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, no, it's uh, it freaked me out the first time that it happened, and then yeah. after I realised he was just that. That's what he did, you know. So yeah. bad. You know, he, he still gets up on the perch and eats and does everything that he needs to do, breeds. So, well, it's cool yeah. that he's moving around because the thing with greens is is actually bloody move, will you? Because like, otherwise yeah. they, just, they just fill up with food and, you know, I, I don't feed mine until they've had a lot of moving around. If I go down there for a few nights, and it's got to be a couple of weeks after I've fed them, if I go down there a few nights and they're all spread out and they're all moving around the cage, then I'll start thinking, oh, I might feed them now. I might give them some feed, you yeah. know, but... Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're interesting greens. Um, with greens, um, I use – my room is is warm. The green tree python room is warm because that's where my hatches and that are as well. Um, oh, you got a full room of greens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So they, they have their, their heat mat on the roof. Um, 
So on their roof, that light and heat mats, unless your room's warm, heat mats on a roof won't do too much. But in, yep. in my opinion, if you've got a, a room that you're keeping ambient 24, you know, 22, 24, um, that heat mat will do the rest for a green to get up to 26, 28 if it wants. Um, and it, it's a it's a really um, unharsh type of heat. It, you know, you see people that use light bulbs and things like that. Um, you know, it's, that's just too harsh for for green trees. Yeah. It's why it's another reason why I use 12 volt lighting in with greens. I'd love to get um, some UV in with my greens, <clears throat> uh, which I am going to at some point, and I want to do it so that they're only going to have it for an hour or two during the day because they they make them too hot they, they heat up the enclosure too much for greens so it's, it's kind of a bit of a problem yes yeah. i want to give them some uv um but that uv can overheat their cages more than i like you know because every problem you have with a, with a green is is you know or most of them is down to being too hot dehydration um and, and stuff like that you know so yeah, I I don't like the idea of putting a light bulb in there, and and those UV tubes and that they get bloody hot. Yeah, they yeah. Get, yeah they especially do. when you're talking the T fives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you guys would know you'd use a lot of things like T fives and that, um, and yeah, they get yeah. warm, and and then the green, you know, all of a sudden you you might, if I started doing that, I would expect to, you know, get get bad sloughs. Um, you know, stuff like that, and looking a bit dehydrated, being a bit dehydrated, and then worst case scenario, um, prolapsing. Um, I think it's got a lot to do um, with, you know, a, a lot of the kinks as well. Um, too hot, too um, dehydrated, and things. I don't think probably helps. I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I wouldn't mind betting that all of those things together, and maybe a bit of uh, a bit of UV as well, might really start turning those things around i don't think uv is the most important thing for is what i guess i'd say yeah no. yeah i'm looking forward to setting up my little hatchies out in my lounge room and testing out a few things on them because i want to have them in actual display cages by the time they're starting to think about going through the color change i kind of want to document it a bit and yeah be able, be able to see it a bit well. easier than just in the tack yeah yeah, yeah exactly you know um but, yeah, that's one thing that I will be doing is a couple of hours a day throwing some UV above them once they get to that stage. Yeah, so, so are yours, what, yours about six months old now? About the same as I think you were before me. Yeah, yeah, so yeah about that. On some good yeah. size on that. Um, yeah, they're pretty pretty decent. Yeah. Um, I think if, uh, a few people that have seen them have, have said that they're reasonably reasonably sizey. Yeah, that's um, nice. I just You're just pulling a tub down to show. Yeah, nice. Yeah, 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 it's about the same as mine. Yeah, they're, they're kind of at that point where, yeah, you can – the trouble is when they're really small babies is they, they – you put food into them, they smash the food, wobble around everywhere to, to coil it up and just hang on by their little end of their towel, you know. So you, you kind of have to keep them yeah. really low down um, in – that. those boxes are ideal what you're using. They're, they're cool boxes. Yeah, that's just a real shallow kind of five yeah. litre – Tub yeah, they're very good for it. Yeah, um, and it, it makes them low to the ground um, and and stop some of those things um, happening, some of those kinks and things. But yeah, at some point, like six months plus, they're probably fine to put a bit higher and and let them actually do a bit of climbing. Yeah. And because exercise is probably going to help with a lot of things with them as well. Um, yeah, and they they use like even in the tub, you know, those guys will go to ground. They'll go everywhere in that yeah. tub. Like, yeah. It's quite funny seeing them use whatever they want to. Um, they're not going to do it for a while now because I just fed them today. But yeah, it's it, it's something that I want to do is kind of build some little tubs or tanks for them or whatever that's got a little bit of height and yeah, you, a bunch of different perch perch sizes and do things. you um I don't know what the what it's like there humidity wise. Do you do any injection of prey items with water or anything? I have been doing it like every few feet, yep. um, but I do feed wet as well. Yeah. So, you know, just to try to get like a bit of moisture on the fuzzies or whatever that I'm feeding yeah, them, cool. just so they're getting a little bit of extra. Um, but yes, yeah, so I do occasionally inject them. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Unless I, I mean, there's the odd occasion where I'm feeding and then I go, oh, shit, I forgot. Um, but I, I, I pretty much do it if I remember pretty much every time I'll put a little bit of water in. Um, and I just think, like, 
what, what harm is it doing? They're going to get rid of that water if they don't need it. So can't yeah. do it. And it, it's all right, like, you know, you get people online saying, oh, you shouldn't need to do that, and da, da, da. But, you know, I live in South Australia, which is the driest state on the driest continent in the world. You know, I, I need to put some effort in um, to, to, to it, yeah. Yeah, I think what a lot of people don't realise as well is a lot of moisture is lost out of frozen food. Yeah, a, yeah, hell of a lot. Right, yeah. I didn't really realise that until about I think it was two or three years ago that someone um, told me that. So yeah, but yes, it's it's yeah. a lot of it. Yeah, so hmm. It's just about giving the snake as much as it can have. Like obviously they've got water bowls in there. I've never seen them drinking out of them, but mm. you know they're there. They're refreshed a couple of times a week. You know, but at the same time, if you are putting half a mill of water or a mill of water or whatever into a little fuzzy mouse, then you're just kind of covering your basis to hopefully avoid any problems. Like, I'm not going to lie, when when they come into shed, they look like absolute shit, you know, like they they look like wrinkly little things and I'm going, ah, oh, damn it, I've let them dry out for, yeah, and they, for too long and or they whatever. they out and they're all good again. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it gives you that little bit of a moment where you, you know. I, let, I normally let my down. hatches dry out maybe once a week. I mean, normally I, I give them a spray, I either every morning or every evening. Um, sometimes if it's hot, like evening and morning, just a bit of a spray in the tub, lift the lift the kind of humidity a bit. Um, yep. I I don't have any choice but to spray them, but I think at that age they they're kind of all right with that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I'm pretty lucky. I don't have to spray my adults. Like I can get away with not doing that. Well, they're Aussies. Um, yeah. They don't yeah, really need the, the wet as much, do they, the Aussies? Yeah, well, well uh, my male's a bit of a question mark on him. Yeah. But, yeah, but I, I've also got six fish tanks in the house. So uh, yeah. that bumps up the relative humidity pretty yeah. quickly to the point where we get condensation on the windows every morning. Mm. So, yeah, that, that does a lot of the work for Are me. yours marine fish or tropical? Or? Uh, I've got one marine tank and... I got Loki's big tank as well, my mangrove monitor. She's got a few hundred liters in in that room there, mm. and then yeah, I've got I think three or f- three or four other little freshwater tanks kicking mm. around. There's an interesting. We're going off topic a bit here. Sorry. Um, no, go for it. We had um, Mark Smith from Adelaide Zoo um, come over. Uh, when was that? Last week, late last week, to do a podcast because um, he's a he's a shark specialist and everything. And um, he was telling me about where, like, aquariums and things uh, in in households, like the the pH value in water, how much it changes, even from seasons, our seasons, to clicking Mm -hmm. on your air con, to putting the heating on. It, it, like, really quickly changes the pH values in in the water in that tank. And I was just shocked by that. Yep. Like, Yep. Yeah, in winter it sucks because you've got it all closed up or whatever. You've got the heat in there, you're breathing in there, and then all of a sudden your pH drops and your corals start suffering and all sorts. So people start doing things like injecting uh, like uh, air lines outside from their skimmers and stuff like that to try to draw in fresh oxygen to keep a pH level up. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's such hard work, isn't it, keeping fish? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think it's that hard personally, no. but you know, like I do not understand what he's saying in that sort of regard. And pH is one of those things that fluctuates a lot for me. Whereas if I keep it, every other parameter stable, it's not so bad. Mm. But yeah, that's an iffy one. Yeah. Hey, so it's funny we get onto the aquarium side, like, you know, aquarium people that spend hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, on, on aquariums and pumps and UV and all that stuff. And then they put a $10 fish in. And you know, reptile people spend ten dollars on a tank and put a fifteen thousand dollar snake in it, don't they? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there's green tree pythons in a five <laughs> liter shoe, but it's next to me. Yeah, yeah. what are they free from? Uh, yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? Right there, uh, and yet I've you know I've got to way too much money invested in my marine tank out there. So yeah, you know, yeah. and then I put a thirty dollar fish in it. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, maybe we should learn by that. Nah, sounds expensive. Yeah. But it's it is swinging a little bit that way, though. Well, that, that, yeah, that's the way that I think you know, guys like Jason and I are trying to push it a little bit to kind of go. You know, we can we can go that way if we want to. We can start tinkering around with some extra gear on top and trying to simulate light cycles or something a little bit better or or whatever it may be. But mm. oh, I yeah. think um, 
you know, from from the point of view of lizards and things like that, it's why I've, I insist on I, I'll only have lizards that can go outside. Like, you know, it's a different level to me to keep in pythons. Um, you know, I, I granted we can still do more than what we do with py- for, for pythons, but you know, when you look at the, the lizards, you know, sides of thing, the geckos, that even the frogs and things, um, you know, you you I think people should probably be making a bit more. Um, a bit more effort with these things like you know it's it is a bit of a crazy situation that you know people look at us python people and think we do things to the bare minimum to a certain extent um i don't think that should be mimicked with lizards and things i think it's a different situation they need a lot more they have you know better eyesight stuff like that um i mean a lot of the time when i see uh, don't get me wrong i love um all the all the real looking enclosures and that i think it's amazing it's not something i'm gonna be i'd never say never because i know that the last five years i've changed my thinking of keeping so i you know i come on here and uh, there was part of me that was thinking when you know earlier today like geez i've changed my thought process on keeping in the last three four five years um Mm -hmm. so i come on here and talk like i don't really know where i'm going to be in the next three, four or five years in my keeping. Um, although I'm quite aligned still with, with what I've always done with pythons, but um, yeah. it's, a, it's a scary prospect if we can't actually make things better. We, we need to make things better. Um, but, yeah. I think if you stop trying to grow a little bit or just trying things here or there or, you know, trying to think outside the box and you know i think it's the guys that get so stuck in this is the only way to do it you know they don't want to have like you know and you know you could have 300 snakes or whatever and you want to have those 300 snakes there but why don't you try something different with a pair of them and see what happens Mm. you know just try to alternate things a little bit and push your own keeping a little bit more you know like i think it's it's awesome how you've got some vivariums there and stuff and you're trying to give the animals a bit more room or whatever it might be or some perching and mm. that actually even on that topic you kind of were talking i know we kind of had a bit of a chat you know the other week or whatever about how you do a little bit of stimulus type stuff even for your animals inside of it's, you know your racks and it's things. one of my um my loves at the moment is the thought of doing like different enrichments um we, yeah. we sat and we did a podcast um, with Richard Gibson, who I knew from London Zoo years and years ago. Um, he didn't really know me, but I knew of him. And we, we did a, a podcast with him uh, in Alice Springs. And we sat down, and, and if I'm completely honest, I've not had this conversation with Richard, and he probably wouldn't listen to any of these because he's a you know very good zoologist. Um, he He was kind of going down that line of, you know, enrichment for pythons and, you know, all of that. And, and I was sat there in all honesty thinking, what a load of crap. Like, Jesus, oh, here we go. You know, because I've spent the whole of my uh, python keeping life just going, I need to keep my pythons with as little stress as possible. That's my aim, is to keep them with as little stress as possible, give them the temperatures, give them everything they need to just relax, chill out, and have an easy life. I thought that was kind of my uh, what I was meant to do. Um, how wrong? Like, how wrong is that? Like, So I, I tried not to give them mm. any stress. Their stress would be once a year, they'd all of a sudden have a male thrown in with them if they're a female, or they'll have a male that, you know, being thrown in with a female, and... But there was not really much. The enrichment in between that was giving them a feed um, and then cleaning them, which all of those things are enrichments. Um, mm. But, you know, I enjoy things like like now. I've done it um, a few times. I don't do this that often because I do still believe that you can still stress the pythons out if you, if you do stuff, you know, too much. Um, I think it's a different scale with lizards and things. They've, they've got a bit more of understanding of what's going on maybe. But with my pythons, like I'll, um, a, a, an enrichment, for instance, I'll go in when they're kind of due for a, a complete clean out rather than a spot clean. Um, I use Chipsy Snake as my substrate in with pythons. I think it's great stuff. Um, and and I'll go in with a bag of hay and I'll put a pile of hay or, or grass cuttings if I get it, but the, the times I've done it, I've used hay. Put a, in, in each tub or each cage 
and you watch and they come out like really quickly. They, they start coming out and start investigating it, start pushing that around. You know, you go back next morning and that's all flattened out and been pushed out and, and everything. Like That's not stress. That Well, it's stress, but it's enrichment stress that enables them to use their senses. Otherwise, I've not mm. really been allowing them to use their senses. So, so I do that at certain points when they're due for a clean and then, couple of days later i'll then get their tub or their cage whatever and clean the whole thing out and and then i'm adding a bit more enrichment because i'm putting new substrate in you know new hide new bowl putting them back in there so they've in effect they've actually had uh, quite a bit of enrichment at that point like a lot of enrichment um so and and on one occasion i mixed that hay got a couple of rats and mixed it in a bag um and, and like let that sort of get all the scent get in and everything and did the same thing again you know it was like because they don't always they, they smell their prey in the wild they don't always get it so it's yeah. like just things like that They're really simple things for pythons and i wouldn't want to go you know i wouldn't want to go over the top i'm not talking about um ha ah, it's midsummer what i'm going to do is enrichment i'm going to turn their heating off or i'm going to put the aircon on and open their cage or, or so you know that's stress we don't do that but slight enrichment things like why not i think you're going to get a healthier animal out of it um yeah i, I do the same sort of thing I, I like you know i even just grab a frozen rat and i'll drag it around a bunch of cages or something like that just to get a bit of smell in there and watch them all go me mental looking for it or yeah. you know get a fresh gum branch or something like that and chuck it in a cage yeah. and watch them go bonkers for the next day or two yeah, i do the 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 like my my tubs if i've got stuff like uh, at the moment i've got some grow on uh, what are they union maybe right, it'll be two years old this hatchy season uh carpet pythons that i've got in cb70 tubs now absolutely not ideal um because of their height because young carpet pythons climb right but it's kind of at the moment my op my only option um so that's where they are um and they get a branch i go out to the garden snap a branch to to the right length and I'll, I'll wedge it in there corner to corner and things like that and they use it they step over they, they step over it jesus did you know that they step <laughs> over things wow <laughs> who's, who's, that's a new low steve, steve. Who? <laughs> Jeez. and they, um, they 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 use the branch like even in a cb70 you know um i, I don't want to put loads of people because there's a lot of people out there that look after their animals really well in racking systems um as yep. long as they don't cram a snake into a tub i don't see a problem with it people look after them they keep them clean it's all good things that they do um so i try not to put everyone under pressure i'm not going to do a youtube channel to go out there and say i'm doing a mock wall i've got nothing against them don't get me wrong this isn't a dig but i'm, I'm not going to go out there i'm doing a mock wall in all of my 30 cages um yeah you know because I, I, I can't i'm not going to do it anyway um because there's no way you'd get me doing that that is the most intense amazing thing that i see some of you guys do like you know matt and christy geez <laughs> it's, yeah, that's it's level. just insane you know and i love it um but i'm not going to do it i'm going to do other things that i can um if i had lizards yep. indoors or frogs indoors i'd be doing something you know i'd be doing more than just keeping them in a blank cage um but you know my my melamine vivs even like this the, the, i'm a firm believer that my snakes don't give a shit if that's white melamine back in or whether i cut you know a, a sheet of the the stuff you can buy and put it in there to make it look better that's definitely for the yeah. keeper not the cat um and there is a certain amount of worry um as well with me because th these things are you know we do it's not a lot we can do about this i'm, I'm just kind of putting it out there as something that it, it, for people to think about we we build a say a four foot enclosure we put some ventilation in it in you know, not a lot of ventilation in it in a room that's not really got any airflow so the ventilation in the cage doesn't really mean that much um we heat that box and then a lot of us including me then put plastic plants in that enclosed area and then put an animal in it you're like really that's you know pretty dumb and really do we need any of that plastic plant in there the snake doesn't care 
Um, you know, it's because it looks way better for me, which is a good thing, you know. Um, but I think we've got to be, yeah, maybe, I don't want to say careful about um, things that, that, you know, in our wooden boxes that we do. I think everyone should keep absolutely everything outside. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, we're in an ideal world, but that's got a lot of cons to it too. <laughs> right, it's impossible. Yeah, it's certainly impossible here. Um, no, yeah. I, try, I try not. I'm, you know, I, I love everything that people are doing in the hobby at the moment. I love the, the bigger caging for animals. I love <clears throat> the mock rocking, the, the bio stuff. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I worry. I do worry about what we do in some of these not very well ventilated boxes and, and we are putting some chemicals in there and that as well so uh, i think it's something that we probably just need to have a think about as well yeah i think i think there are a lot of a lot of people that build custom cages sometimes you know they they do those little tiny puck fence and stuff around the front of the cage maybe up the back wall of the cage or whatever but they don't get the same sort of cross flow as a lot of the off your shelf off the shelf kind of cages as well you know like there's a lot of brands out there that are better than others or whatever but you know i kind of like having cages that have like a full top ventilation area which always isn't effective because you can lose a lot of heat and and all that sort of stuff so it's not going to be efficient but at the same time if there's a little bit more cross flow and i mean i'm even starting to play with fans on top of all of them and then have them come on multiple times a day to try to draw a bit of fresh air and stuff into cages yeah but if you if you have too much of our cooler air blowing around the room in you know in that heat it can cause its own troubles as well um it's something like it's something that i've just brought up the ventilation in cages that is almost like impossible to change we've been doing it for the last 30 40 50 years whatever um but you know you can put a you could put a back on the cage that's just you know the pegboard um on the whole back of the cage but you still haven't got airflow that's coming in and out of that cage we're still there's still always going to be a, a limited amount of airflow in those cages and i think it's yeah i don't know sometimes i worry about it um and then i put my snake back in and shut the door so i don't worry that much do i um no it's, it's all things that i you know i hope to you, you you have that conversation and then someone can come back and, and have an idea for that um you know yeah i mean i, I was even talking to a friend the other day um about an experiment that we'd love to be able to con- conduct, but n- neither of us have the time for it. I'm not sure if somebody's done it before. They probably have. But even just having, you know, a- as you said before, you know, you, you're you pretty sure that the snake doesn't give a crap or whatever about the white melamine, the black melamine, or a picture or whatever like that. Like, it'd be awesome to be able to do an experiment and see if they have a reaction to that because, you know, like white's a pretty unnatural color in, in nature, so it'd be it'd be kind of weird to see like I mean obviously different animals different eyesight all the rest maybe it's a bit different for something like a lizard versus a python or something like that but when know, I'm, it'd be cool for somebody to be able to do that experiment. Yeah, but right? when I'm talking about things, I, I I only talk about pythons. I don't have the knowledge. <clears throat> I think for sure with lizards, they're going to cling to it. They're going to climb around it. It's going to be extra things for them to do. Um, I think yeah. the python's going to get that and much of it that that amount of enrichment out of it as what it does when you put fresh substrate in there it's kind of like oh yeah cool yeah. cool 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 forgot about it now yeah I, yeah I just and it's you know none of that I, I don't mean it in a massive negative like you know it is uh, with pythons it's for the keeper not the kept well that's still a great thing you know we, we still yeah. feel like we're we're keeping them better and, and doing all these things um you know and, and with pythons geez you, you get a big python that shits up the back of one of those walls bugger that yeah <laughs> you know i, I <laughs> need to be able to look after my stuff and the easy you know the easy answer to that well you should have less animals but it kind of doesn't work like that neither um, i yeah. care for the animals i've got pretty well <clears throat> um yeah they're, they're all just conversations to, to you know but it's important to talk about it too because even if we trigger some thoughts to some people sitting at home or whatever like that and they might want to try something a little bit different or you know they may agree with me or or not agree with me or whatever it might be but at the same time it's about having that conversation and trying to get people thinking yeah Yeah, Yeah. anyway let's bring this conversation back around i want to talk about some owen pellies after finding that owen pelly in the world keep mentioning that 
every time I can. Yeah. <laughs> You've you actually found some Owen Pellies too, didn't you? You've seen a couple. Well, I don't like to talk about it much, but we found two in two days. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> That's bloody good going. I wish I could say the same yeah. thing. That's for sure. They, they, they're cool. They are. You know, it's it's just an unbelievable python. It's unbelievable that we've got them in captivity. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're, we're all learning about them. And, you know, I, I can only comment on, you know, I, I was lucky to see them in, I've not studied their wild or anything like that. Jeez, we were there for a couple of nights and we struck gold twice, you know. Um, <clears throat> keeping them in captivity um, you know, I don't even think we know that much about them. That you know, things that I've learned from Owen Pellies are things like, you know, they they literally tell you when they want to be fed. Um, like a green tree python, you feed it tonight, tomorrow night it will probably be s down, waiting for another feed, and blah blah blah. And Owen Pelly, you know, it's just you go into the room if the Owen Pelly is out, um, you go anywhere near it, it. Most of the time, it will go away. It will go in its hide. It will go as far away from you as it can to get away from you. Very shy. Mm. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, in you know a couple of weeks or whatever, it will come towards you. And like really weird, you, you literally like people that got them will, I, I reckon, will know exactly what I mean. I, I know Matt said the same thing, Matt Bonnet. Um, all of a sudden. It, they come towards you and start coming at you and getting really bold from something that is timid and just wants to get away. Um, and you go in like next night, you see that next night, as long as it's like more than a couple of weeks after you fed it last time, next night you go in and it will just smash food. Um, just absolutely smash. It will smash anything that goes in front of it. You put your hand there, it will have it. Um, uh, it yeah, they're just really interesting in the way that they – they, the, the others, we just go, oh, it's about two weeks, so we'll feed you, you know, with, with yeah. a lot of pythons um, and boas for that fact, you know. That, but these things just, yeah, really do let you know. Greens are different. Greens will tell you they want fed every night until they die of fatness. Um, but, yeah, the Owen Pellies, very hard to work out. It's like holding a um, massively oversized tree snake when when you've got them uh, they're very they, they can be quite loose as well which is weird but then they'll tighten up and they'll just want to go up and and do things um just weird at uh, the color change jesus the the color change can be immense they're kind of on a similar path to roughies in that sense hey where they they really yeah lighten up. i guess like the escarpment type of animal like that you know roughies are, are, are kind of like that i'm not totally sure why i haven't worked i mean uh, i think people normally say like it's night and day and things like that but i've gone in the middle of day and they've been like it i've i've fed them and they've lightened up and gone like it and then other times i've fed them and they're, they're dark and don't make any color change i i, I really yeah. i'm not totally sure what reacts that color change but it's big like roughies do it but these do it like way more than roughies in my opinion like are we talking like uh time frame wise like they they do it quicker or are you talking like they just do it more regularly they like just um i, I don't know like time, I, it, no just the, the 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 difference between light and dark is is okay. a bigger gap than a roughie. bigger jump yeah it's huge like you go in there sometimes and they almost look kind of white um, other times they can look really dark and drab and horrible. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, they're just really weird. But what I've noticed as well with my um, um, frill neck lizards, uh, they do the same well, they, every night. When I, I go down to look at them at night just to see the whiteness of them at night, yeah. they're, they're insane. Like during the day, they're these brown things with a big frill. Um, and then at night you go, and they're literally just a ghost, a white, kind yeah. of greyish white, exanthic almost ghost. Just amazing. I still remember the first time I saw my frill neck do that, and I was just like, what the hell? And I poked him to make <laughs> sure he was okay, and he hissed up at me. I was like, all right, yeah. all right. Well, what a difference. Then, yeah, it still took me a few. Yeah, it's it, like white, like paper yeah. white. Well, like the rough scale pythons don't go to that extent, or I've not seen them mm. go to that extent, but Owen Pelly's go to that 
like they really do they, they really get bright and it, it's almost like it's such a change that you actually look and you think they've changed pattern um you yeah. know it changed they change that much that it almost looks like they've changed their pattern but it isn't it's just because they've just changed color so much it's uh pretty insane did we lose jason I don't know where Jason's gone. He might just be kind of hanging there in the background trying to save the internet so yeah. the, the podcast keeps recording. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm listening, but every time I try and talk or anything, it, my internet drops out. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, He definitely needed to have a couple of beers tonight then. He would have been sitting back enjoying this. Um, so as far as diet goes, I know a lot of people say that they they – a little bit hit and miss or some people say that they're a bit hit and miss on you know different things like rats and quails but how have you found yours um well as soon as i got mine the 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 four that we originally got um they um they fed really easily on rat fluffs like you know really quickly and really easily on on rat fluff so i I, we we kept them for the first i don't know year or two uh, on rats um and, and they grew up, they've grown up mainly on rats, all of them. Um, but I'll, I'll be honest, this last, um, I've always been someone who's been kind of um, stick to rats because it's like, especially with birds, if you feed a lot of pythons with birds, they're, they're relu- more reluctant to eat rats. Um, mm. So uh, I, I kind of used to stick to that. But this last year of feeding her, I've actually um, given her a quail and a rat whenever I feed. So I, I half the size of the rats. Rats are, are fatty as hell anyway. And and I'll get, you know, she'll have normally about a 200, 250 gram rat and about a 200 gram quail um, at the moment. If I, I mean, she's stopped feeding now. I'm not going to feed her anymore um, this, you know, before this season. So normally, yeah, she'd have that. So between four and 500 gram feed every probably few weeks. Um and, and, yeah, so I, I just decided, like, you know, I, I think that they they probably do eat a lot of birds in the wild, mm. and, I, and I kind of, part of me thinks that I was happy to feed him rats, and rats isn't, you know, it's not the end of the world, and they've, they've done well, and a lot of people struggle to get rats, so you kind of think, well, it's, you know, uh, to get them to feed rats, so you kind of think that's all right. But then I, part of me kind of started thinking that maybe kind of depriving her a little bit of something, Um so I, I've started giving her, yeah, like I say, quail as well. But thankfully, like she is, this has been, I don't know, from maybe two years old to now, um, and she will still take a rat as well as the quail. She, it, it hasn't completely turned her off of eating rats. Um, it, it's That's sometimes cool. a bit harder to get her to eat a rat, but um, she will still eat the rat as well. Yeah. I, I got my olive... Um... He, when I first got him, he was eating mice. Then I transitioned him to rats, and then all of a sudden he wasn't eating for ages. And then I offered him a quail, and then he ate the quail. Never went back to rats or mice. He'd grab them, he'd wrap them, yeah. and he'd drop them. And I was just like, "All right, quail it is." Yeah, it's just, just, it just sucked it up. And- uh, it worries me because when you got a large collection, and if you start doing things like that, you, you know, all of a sudden I'm screwed because you can't get quail that easily, and they're not that yeah. cheap. Um, you know, sadly, yeah. we go for rats and mice because that's what's produced in mass for us, and that's the cheap way around it. You know, because otherwise, you blimey, I can't think. I mean, South Australia is the most expensive place in the world for electricity. Australia must be the most expensive place in the world for rodents. Um, you know, in England, I used yeah. to pay one pound fifty, two pound for a three hundred, three fifty gram rat. You know, over here, that's yeah potentially 10 bucks um mm. so it, it, one of the biggest shocks when i moved over here was the price of rodents it's insane um yeah it's not cheap no so, definitely, definitely not cheap. but yeah I, I kind of thought if she's missing out on something so that i'll give her some quail as well um so for the last however long she's been having quail and rat so yeah. it does well yes yeah, does well the mouths um rats um yeah how, so how old are they now they're a few years old so they will be i think three and a half now or three and a half come 
come June. I think something like that. And you, you, so you've probably got a couple of years to go before they're ready to give a no, crack. No, we're giving them a crack this year. Oh, cool! So they're up to size. Yeah, then. the female's three, three and a half meters. Um, yeah, I, I, I hear that they grow so quick. Yeah, they, they've just had the last probably year of um, of filling out. You know, so so grow, they grow lengthwise and they look really skinny, but you know, um, they they spent some time. And this year, I don't. You know, I'm not. Oh, I'm going to breed them this year. Like, th- there's no harm in me giving them a try this year and mm. and you know putting them through a, a winter at the very least um they've, they've had a winter every year up to now but you know yeah. putting them through more of a winter um this year and and just why not you know give them a go um they yeah. either will or they won't um and you don't know if you don't try right? no that's right yeah and if not there's next year it's all it's all yeah. good i don't think like that they're, they're gonna be i don't know sometimes i say i think they're gonna be you know, hard, and then other times maybe not so hard. I don't. I really don't know what to expect, but um, yeah, we'll give it a go. It's, ex- it's exciting times ahead for Owen Pelly keepers, though, because obviously Gav's done an awesome job and and got them yeah. easily kind of nailed down. But then it's kind of cool to see them be in the next set of hands around the country and and kind of watch you guys be able to kind of figure it out and yeah, compare notes and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, places like South Australia and, and you know, if, if it was the same in England or something, you know, they're far away from their natural kind of conditions. Um, you know, like Northern Territory to South Australia, is, is, there, there's quite a big difference between those two, uh, winters and summers. It's, you know, it's but the same with blackheads and, and um, olives, I guess, as well, so... Yeah, fingers crossed we can only try and um you know if, if i thought she wasn't in any sort of condition to do that yet then i wouldn't do it but yeah so we we also have to kind of just touch on a little bit about the aussie wildlife show because obviously that's a really successful podcast i've enjoyed listening to that for for quite some time you. now yeah. um you guys get some of the brightest minds from around australia mm-hmm. to come on and talk about flora and fauna and all sorts but um how did the show come about with you and adrian oh uh, well I got to know Adrian um, quite well. We've become good friends. Like, you know, he's a wealth of knowledge. He's, you know, he, he does, uh, he runs a company called Animals Anonymous, which he goes out to schools and parties and things and educates about animals. So he's kind of in that circle anyway. And uh, one day I was up there and he just went, Steve, we're going to, uh, we're going to do a podcast together. And, and I said, ah, no, we're not. Absolutely <laughs> never. And he, he taught me around and, um, it, it, you know, it, it, I, I love it. I, I still get nervous. Like I spoke to you on the phone the other day, you know, still get nervous doing it. Um, I still sit there and we're, what have we got? 90 odd, I think 92 episodes out. Um, and, and I still get nervous sitting there starting a podcast. Like it, it's still, yeah, I, I don't like it. Like today, you know, I've been today, I've been so nervous coming on this, you know, that, that my house is immaculate. My car's the cleanest it's ever been. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like blue tongue babies or, or shingle back babies, you know, it's, it's an insane thing, but you just love it. I learned so much from doing it. Cause like you say, we are so blessed to have some amazing people on the show, like some yeah. absolute geniuses on the show. Um, and that, that's a lot to do with um, the circles that, that uh, Adrian goes in, that we both go in now. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, it's just brilliant. I just, if, I, if I'm learning something from an episode, I, I'm loving it. And I think every single one of those episodes I've learned something from, and I just think that's the main thing. I still sit there, 92 episodes in, and Adrian knows to leave me with the... Um, all the all the sound stuff that we got because we got all the kit mics and everything like your set up there you know mics and headphones and everything yeah. we insist on headphones and stuff like that and i still sit there for the first five or ten minutes or more messing around with um dials not actually turning them it's just my way of going i'm not going to talk yet no i'm not saying a bloody word yet. <laughs> yeah. i ain't talking um and then i start feeling uncomfortable because adrian's doing all the talking and then i have to say something um which is normally some idiot you know english sense of humor thing that i'll kick off with <laughs> just 
you know, it's just nervousness more than anything. Um, but I love it. Uh, Adrian, yeah, he's, you know, he's a hero of mine. He knows so much. He's, he's great on the mic. I think he, he holds a lot of the, um, and he'll say, Oh yeah, I think you hold a lot of them together now as well. And that, but he does hold a lot of those shows together. Um, we only do them live. Like we don't do it like we're doing today, like over the internet. Yeah. Um, we do them like live. Um, hence why over the last couple of years of COVID, we haven't done that many. Um, I think if we knew COVID was going to last two years, we might have actually done some other stuff like, to, to get in. Yeah. But, um, you know, every six months you go, no, it'll be all right soon. No, it'll be good soon. We'll be out to crack on again. We'll do trips and da, da, da. And it never came, came around. Whereas now, you know, I think we've got four or five to edit, sitting there to edit now. Um, we've got awesome. some great people to come on. Matt Bonnet's coming on soon. He's, he'll, he'll be good. Um, yeah, we, we've got some going, and we'll do a trip soon as well. We want to uh, do another trip, another, I don't know where to go, New South Wales, Queensland or something, just because we do a trip for a few days, but we'll get, you know, four or five podcasts doing that. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I love it. Absolutely love it. We've had, like, the, the amount of downloads and, and stuff that we've had just blows my mind. I just, you know, uh, yeah, massive shout out and thanks to everyone that supports it because we, we get, you know, like you guys saying what you just said and, and everyone, it's just insane. I love it. Absolutely. But when you get feedback like that too, it's like fuel because I get what you mean. You're kind of anxious. You don't you don't know if you still want to do it or, or, or whatever because it's a bit daunting putting yourself out there. So I, I, I can relate to those nerves 100%. Mm. But at the same time, when you get somebody come up to you and go, oh, I listened to this show and it was fantastic or send you a message or whatever it might be, it's kind of like, all right, cool, we're doing something good. People are enjoying it. Yeah, right. You know, like it, it's yeah, fuel for the fire. Exactly right. And we've, um, I mean, I don't like to show off or anything, but but we've both had occasions where we've had our voices uh, recognised. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty <laughs> cool. I recognise your voice. What's that from? <laughs> and, and you kind of, in the end, you have to say, you, you listen to the Aussie Wildlife. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> Weird. It's a bit embarrassing, but but cool. You know, it's it's good. But yeah, the Aussie Wildlife Show. Um, it's uh, it's good fun. It's it's great. We have some. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's it's all wildlife. And on the odd occasion, we might even go abroad and do stuff. We've done some in Borneo. Um, so yeah, more well, I think it's so interesting because you know, like I listen to heaps of reptile podcasts, like because obviously that's kind of my cup of tea, so to speak. Mm. But at the same time, like I always love listening to it, and you'll be talking about fossils on one episode, or some little water bugs, or you know, the ecology of a river, or yeah. you know, this random mammal, or something like yeah. that. You know, like it's just so diverse, and it's I find it very intriguing. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm I'm starting to head up bone ass syndrome i'm starting to listen to myself again just recently <laughs> and then I'm, I'm starting to go through them and i'm remembering and learning stuff again because some of them you know like we had tim faulkner like geez yeah. we, we had him on a show i mean it was it was amazing some of the information and stuff that he he um, spoke about on there and the way that he looks at things it, it's just to me it was just amazing you know i've, I've listened to that a few times and and can learn something every time I bloody listen to it or, or it's more that yeah. you know it, these things sink like they take a little while to sink into me so sometimes I have to listen to them three or four times um and then they start sinking in but but I get that from everyone you know I'll listen to yours and I'll learn stuff from yours and um Justin's and and that like the um fight club amazing the fight club's awesome the NPR network as, as a whole like I mean they've got far too many out now I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to follow all the others like go out yeah. one that I'm like, well, I want to listen to that, but crap, when do I do that? Like, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's difficult, but yeah, it's it's a good time for podcasts and things. But yeah, we're on we ours goes out to on every network possible. I think on every every single place possible. Um, it's on Podbean, but it's everywhere everywhere we search. So, yeah. yeah, love it. No, it's good stuff. So we're all doing good. good we're all stuff. doing good in the world of podcastians. Well, uh, on top of your podcast, though, you're also doing some online courses as well, aren't you? Mm, yes. Um, it, yeah, we've got at the moment. I've got two courses out. It, it, um, this is my. It was my way of writing a book. Being, you know, it was meant to be writing a book, but making it easier for me. 
Um, and all the work, apart from me talking, was done by my wife, um, who uh, has, in my opinion, done an amazing job on these courses. There's one course um, which is, uh, what's it called? A Guide to Choosing Your First Snake. Um, yep. That's a free course. And it's it's a worldwide course. Like, it, it, you know, you can listen to it in every country and there'll be things about garter snakes and, you know, choosing what your what your ideal first pet will be, not Burmese pythons, um, <laughs> stuff like that. So there's that. It's a free course. It takes 30 minutes and, you know, that's had so many looks. It's unreal, but then it's free, so it would. And, and a lot of good feedback, you know, that you, people feedback and just say, well, there's things in there I didn't even know that I should be asking um, which makes sense that you know so it's, it's been good but then the, you know our, our baby one which is that pythons care and husbandry um yeah that's uh, uh you have to pay for that course i think it's 55 australian um yeah that they're, they're, they're on you to me but if anyone actually wants to do the course you, you can you please go to my facebook or my website um, and use the links on there to get to the course. And full disclosure, if you do it that way, I get way more money than if you go onto Udemy and find my course. Like we're talking loads, like, you know, a big difference of the cuts. Um, so please use my links if you do my course. Um, but it's out there. It's, it's. Um, I, I know I shouldn't say it, but I think it's a bloody good course. You know, it's, it's in depth as hell. Um, and it hits on how I keep pythons and 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 that you know it's um, it's a good course. It, there's a lot of work gone into it. Um, it's not because it's a paid course. It doesn't get as many um, hits as as you know uh, maybe a book or or if it wasn't a paid course. Um, but geez, it like when we decided to do it, my wife decided that we were going to do it. I should say. Um, we was like yeah we got a good laptop we can do that but when we got all the design stuff on the computer like we had to spend thousands on a new computer to run it all mm. and to you know so it's cost us a lot of money and it would be nice to see more people do it um it's it's had you know don't get me wrong there's there's a, quite a few people have done it but you yeah. know i think it could definitely be out there more but it covers everything um so, so what's the course kind of involved? Is it like something that's like a practical course in the sense that somebody's going to sit down and actually like go through and answer questions or anything like that? Or is it kind of like a course where they're going to listen to you talk about certain subjects? Of course, they're listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> it is. No, it's literally you, you go on there, you sign up for the course and, you know, it's got sections, different, different sections that you click on. You watch me yep. or listen to me where there's information coming up on screen or I'm talking with animals to demonstrate what we're talking about. So it's like, like kind of, yep. you, I've got animals if I'm demonstrating handling techniques, um, you know, I'm, I'm filming vivs and I'm talking while I'm there, you know, about how I've built vivs, how I heat vivs, all of the stuff that you need to know on how I keep a snake. Um, yep. And you go section by section and after, you know, there'll be a, a section on, I don't know, enclosures and that. And then you'll do a few bits in that. And at the end, there'll be kind of a little question thing there. Simple, like, obvious question thing. Um, and and then, you know, it just goes through. And it's it probably, there's, there's, I think it's almost almost about four hours of stuff there. But obviously, you wouldn't do it in four hours because you'd be re-listening or, or looking back, clicking to the next section and things. But, you know, you can certainly do it over a, a couple of days. Um, or an evening or something, you know, it's, it's very basic, but it's, it's not basic. I mean, the whole thing, like it's basic to use, really easy to use, but like, as most people have told me that, that have done it, like it's very in depth. Um, people have been surprised yeah. at how in depth it was. Like Birchie did it, uh, Pete Birch did it and he nearly had me in tears when he was like giving me, he rung me up to give me feedback and, and, you know, told me how he, he's, amazed by it you know it's reminded him of things he used to do and it's taught him of new things that he can do and and stuff and i think we can all learn something from someone you know if, if someone else was yeah. like that i'd do it I'd, I'd sit down and do it because definitely we can all learn from things like that um and it's not you know it's not geez 55 bucks for 
No, and you, and you you you've got it for life, like on Udemy. You you download it on Udemy, and you you as long as you've got an account with Udemy, you go on there and do it in five years' time, in ten years' time, you know, just just like a book, I guess. And I'm a book lover. I love books. I'd spend probably way more money on books than I do bloody animals this last six months. I've been catching up on my book collection, um, <laughs> which I hear you guys have as well. Um, yep. it's, yeah, it's it's difficult, that one, the books. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, it's another addiction. Yeah, but, but this is something that I've done, I've put out there, and it, it made me as nervous as hell putting it out there. But I am super, super proud of it. And, and there's been some amazing people online that have shared it around and done their best for us and everything, you know, even Wayne and Deb Larks and, and people like that that have shared it around. So many people that I didn't expect to share it around that I, I expected Wayne to share it around. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you know, it, it's just the, the feedback's been brilliant. I just need more people to do it. Um yeah, no, awesome. That's um, that's something I've never even considered. But I suppose one of those things is you know the benefit of doing like an online course where there's videos like that too. Is it's one thing to sit down and read something in a book, but to be able to see like physical yeah. demonstrations of certain thing. And I think this day and age too, we are in a, a pretty, uh, you know, everyone wants to watch everything type world. You know, mm. where it's a lot harder for people to sit down and and read a book or, or they're less likely to versus watching a video or something on how to do something. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love books. Uh, my trade is uh, is bookbinding. So that's my original trade when I left school was bookbinding, oh, cool. printing and bookbinding. Um, so I'll, I'll always buy books. I love books. Um, it, but, yes, in nowadays you need sometimes something different to a book, you know, and, and I think this course is that. And I think other people should follow up and, and do one as well, like, you know, get get into it as well, I think, because it's a good way of doing it. Like, you know, you see me talking about a snake um, that's, that's, you know, I'm saying how you how you figure out whether it's going to strike at you and, and I'm kind of there going, oh, it's going to strike now. And then it strikes, you know, and you're kind of pointing out to people um, and, you know, you're holding a snake and, and showing someone what you mean by be a tree, you know, don't freak it out. And, and then you kind of wave in front of it and it strikes at you and you go, well, you know, that's what, that, that's what's going to happen and and to actually see it kind of live and in front of your face i, I think does add a good yeah. aspect to it um i was super i mean it's my I, i'd be cleaning snakes my wife um my wife would uh still like she'd come down watch me cleaning snakes and be asking me questions and i would uh, be asking her you know answering the questions like how do you keep this in this and how do you heat this and what do you use to heat and She'd be, and then she'd write kind of scripts for me to, to go by. And then she'd get it on a computer and she'd edit it and she'd put it all together. Like, I did nothing. And, and it really, in hindsight, it really, like, pisses me off to a certain extent that I did that small amount, but you guarantee probably six out of ten times that she would come and ask me something. Like, I'm too busy now. Don't, just leave me alone. I need to do, you know, because I just, it yeah. just scared me doing it. And, like, the end, the thought at the end that, that we're going to release something with me on it just, yeah, just scared me. So I was always quite wound up about it. Um, and and so was she, you know, she was nervous. I probably didn't help. She she did so much work. She had a lot going on as well um, at the time. And But we got it out. And it's, yeah, it's like I say, I'm so super proud of it. Um, but, yeah. But it, so you should be. Yeah, it all goes back to, you know, I've been blessed in my keeping life, um, you know, back from the UK, the people that I used to uh, hang around with and talk to over there, you know, the late and best in the world, Frank Schofield, um, you know, and, and you know, your Paul Harris's and, and some of the people that I knew over there, Ian Stevens from London Zoo, I, I just had the best friends over there who I could look up to and learn from. And, and then I've been lucky enough. I I'm, I'm, shouldn't name a few names. So I've chucked some names in there. And, and then I'm going to have other people that will go, oh, yeah, nice one. What about me? Um, I'm sorry <laughs> if I don't mention your name. There are far too many names that I look up to in England. Um, and then I move over here. And, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm you know, um, having people like Matt Bonnet, people like um, Pete. Um, you know, Birchie and, and people like that to still look up to over here and, and still learn, through, learn from. 
I feel like I've I've been blessed with who I've known over the years of me keeping stuff. Like, you know, some of the best keepers on that. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, that's all led to me doing this course. I've kind of done it because I have learned from some of the best. Um, I do still keep it quite basic um, or very basic, but then I'm a Python keeper. Like You can't get too technical with, with them. Um, so, you know, it, it's all gone down in the course and it's all out there. And I beg and plead people to please do my course. Any country in the world. It's So... To do your course, what's the website that you've got it at? Well, my if you go to uh, my Facebook, has it on? So my Facebook and in Prestige Pythons or Steve Crawford, it's got links there. It's got um, stuff on there. Instagram's got it there as well that you can go. But if you go to my website, www.prestigepythons.com.au, um, it's got a page on there that's got all the links. And like I say, if you if you do it through those links, um, I become very rich. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> and then you buy more. Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm able to pay back some of the computer debt. No. <laughs> yeah, so if they go to my website, um, which my website I am updating a lot at the moment to try and get to the point where I can get animals on it um, for sale because um, I've got stuff for sale. Um, and it's hard to do on Facebook and places now. So I want to get my website up and running again. But the courses are on there. Um, yeah, you click on. There's also, for any shops and things that people might want, like there's some print-off A4 kind of posters with QR codes that link you to the course. We know everyone loves QR codes nowadays. So um, those, posters, well practiced. Yeah, those posters are there um, to send you straight to the course as well. But, yeah, that's... Uh, that's where the courses are. Love it. I, I love that. I love everything I'm doing at the moment. It's good. I'm happy with my animals, happy with the way I'm keeping. Aussie Wildlife Show is great. Yeah, the, the courses are out there and Prestige Pythons is going strong. So it's good time. To oh, good podcast. stuff, right? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, well, it was a perfect time to jump on a podcast and do some, do some self-promotion. You know, I think um, more people can learn from this sort of stuff. Yeah. So now it's all good stuff. And, Probably on that positive note, Steve, we'll we'll wrap it up here, mate. So thank you so much for coming on and having this chat. This has been awesome. Thank you. And I've definitely learned a little bit and stuff as well. So, you know, that's all we've got to do is keep learning from each other at the end I of the day. I think you're absolutely right. And no, I appreciate you, um, yeah, pushing me to come on. Um, it's something I should have done more of in the past. But, um, yeah, anyone who wants to, to get hold of me, feel free on my Facebook and everything, Prestige Python, Steve Crawford, um, Instagram, yeah, I'm trying to build Instagram up a bit. So if anyone can get on there and show me how I actually get more people, I've done all right. I've, I'm, I'm doing all right, but geez, I see people there with thousands. I'm getting a bit jealous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the grass isn't always greener. No, that's right. Yeah, that adds other problems, doesn't it? But, yep. Yeah, cool. And and I have got my YouTube channel that one day or, or pretty soon I'm going to start putting stuff up on, and that's called the Reptile Plus Network. Plus spelt P L U S, the Reptile Plus Network. I'll have to go and give you a subscription. Thank then. you. That's why I said it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've got again, you've got loads of followers. You do really well on that. That's great. Pretty amazing. Yeah, it's, it's taken off in the last year or so. I think it's steadily ramping. It's not not going crazy or anything. A lot of work because you've got some good edit, editing on yours. So yeah, congrats on that. Looks really good. Oh, it takes up a lot of my yeah, time. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, but no, it's a, it's good fun. I get a kick out of editing. Um, not when you're editing seven different videos at once, though. That becomes a bit intense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it's good. Thanks for having us on, right. and good luck in the future with your baby. Congratulations. Yeah, it's thank you, really... thank you. Hopefully, I've got my own in in house helper. <laughs> yeah, that's so. right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Child labor is not a thing, right? Or well, you don't get in trouble yeah. in this country, surely? Yeah. <laughs> no, if you don't tell anyone. Yeah, we'll keep it under wraps then. <laughs> Alrighty, guys, on that note, we'd like to say a massive thank you to Eric and Owen and the rest of the NPR crew for having us. If you'd like to contact them, it's best to find them at MoreliaPythonRadio.com and email them at info at MoreliaPythonRadio.com. Make sure to follow the NPR network on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. As far as contacting us on our social media platforms, you can email us at AustralianHerptoculture at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram as well. 
make sure to check out our Teespring store for the podcast merch. The link is on the Facebook page. To see more of what Jason is, is doing, make sure to follow him on Facebook and Instagram at The Gecko Effect. For myself, you can find me on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, and Teespring under Feature Scaly Beast. We hope to have you back next week for another episode of the Australian Hepatic Culture Podcast. Good night, everyone.